Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Tuesday topic. Uh, today's topic is CNHP Reads The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas. Um, while we're waiting for everyone's microphones to turn on um, and for other folks to come into the room to join us, um, just a couple of notes about a few upcoming Tuesday topics. Uh, next week's Tuesday topic, um, more about Smartsheet, is going to be a um, pre recorded webinar. Uh, so if you're interested in seeing that webinar, um, register at the site and we'll make sure we send you a link when the um, webinar is available. Uh, so our next live Tuesday topic is going to be on Tuesday, May 4. That'll be uh, to sim, to play, per chance to learn. And then uh, the week after that, e-learning capacity, building in under-resourced regions, lessons learned and strategies for success. And so for today's panel on um, CNHP Reads the Hate You Give by Angie Thomas, I'm going to throw it over to uh, Professor Sharna Pearl, Dr. Pearl. Hi, everybody. Uh, before we start, I'm going to introduce the panelists and just frame the discussion. I want to acknowledge that we are all feeling very on edge right now. I don't know about the rest of you, but I am toggling to wait for the verdict in the, in the Chauvin George Floyd shooting case. And we will be updating everybody if any news comes in. But we did wanna start with just a moment of silence for George Floyd and all the other victims of racial violence in this country of which there are many. So please do join me for a moment of silence. Thank you. I also want to acknowledge that we in at Drexel and in Philadelphia are on the unceded lands of the Lenape peoples. And I want to honor the Lenape peoples and hope that by acknowledging them and their presence, we can continue to work towards dismantling the legacies of settler colonialism, both here and across the United States. We're probably all reflecting that this book feels incredibly timely and poignant. And I think one of the messages, the enduring messages of systemic racism is that it's going to feel timely for a long time and has felt timely for a long time. This is not a new story. It was written in 2018, but it feels like it could have been written yesterday or 20 years ago. And that's one of the provocations of this text is to force us to confront how enduring the legacies and ongoing perpetuation of racism is state-sponsored violence and racism and also individual acts of racism, aggression, and so on. So we wanted first, well, first I'm gonna introduce the panelists and then, and then invite Phoebe to make a few comments. And then after that, we are going to open it up for discussion. And I wanted to say that First, to honor both the book and the emotions that people might be experiencing right now, I want to keep this as a flexible session. We all want to keep this as a flexible session, so we'll invite you to just share any initial thoughts and reflections, and then if we want to move into a more formal discussion, we certainly have a lot of interesting ideas and questions to present, but if we want to turn it in a different direction, then we are happy to keep it as a more informal discussion. The judge just sat in the case, um, somebody noted. Uh, also, there's a small group, so we should be able to generate a nice discussion, but in order to avoid folks talking over each other, perhaps you can either raise your hand or use the chat box or turn your camera on or just kind of like wave and we'll try to facilitate it. But because we do have this nice intimate group, I think it should be okay. So I want to introduce uh, Professor Jesse Ballinger. 
who is my colleague in health administration and is like me, a historian of medicine and bioethicist. And we work together with the um, Board of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion and the Board of Global Healthcare Engagement to facilitate this. And we're envisioning it being potentially an ongoing experience. I'd also like to invite Vivi Bardwaj to make a few comments. She is an undergraduate in health sciences and one of our esteemed commentators on the text. So Vivi. Um, hi everyone. So on behalf of the other student panelists and I, we just wanted to say, give a couple of our thoughts when we first read this book. So a lot of us are reading this book for this discussion. This is the second or third time we've actually read this book. And I think that was very important for all of us because the first time you read the story, you read it as a story of a young girl who's learning to find her voice, who's navigating this world where these problems of systemic racism and police brutality are constantly occurring and how she has to, how she's put in the middle of all of this and how she has to navigate through that situation. But the second time you read it, the second and third time you read it, you start looking at your own implicit biases and you start looking at how you view the world and how that makes me feel so a little bit relieved. I think I actually just mistyped. It's the first charge was found guilty. The second charge was found guilty. Third charge found guilty. I'm sorry to interrupt. Vivi, please no, continue. That's okay. We can take a moment for that as well. But I think given the context of what's happening, that feels so almost relieving to know that the justice system can work. As opposed to what happened in our book. Absolutely, yes. And scores of times in history. Although, I, you know, to, given the events of the past two years, it's also worth reflecting on how much has to happen for this country to find a murderer of a black man guilty in this, a police officer of a black man guilty. Like so much went into producing this verdict for what should just be justice. Anyway, I'm sorry, your your voice. I don't want to cut off your voice in, in this. No, that's okay. Um, I think going back to the book that it's reading it a couple times over makes you realize how present those issues still are and how important it is to recognize those within your own community, within your own your own life and seeing that like those things still exist even if we don't recognize it, or even if we don't um, notice it explicitly, there are, there are still subtle things that show that systemic racism still exists, that police brutality still exists, that all of it is still very real. And reading this book sort of, for me, it kind of created a little bit of that frustration that Star felt throughout the end of the novel when that verdict came out as not guilty, as opposed to right now. Um, I felt her frustration and I, and I also felt that like, you know, you have to use your voice, but it's also important to recognize that not everyone can use their voice all the time because it can backfire on them. So that's one thing that we really wanted to highlight is the fact that it's so important to use your voice, but it's important to use to to know when to use your voice and to know when it's risky to also protect yourself and protect who you want to protect without putting anyone in danger. So that's sort of what we had got from the book. I think that's really powerful and, and um, I appreciate it. And from my perspective, just one thing I would um, add is also when to know when your voice or my voice is the voice that is not wanted, right? Or how to use my voice to support other voices instead of trying to take over, you know, as a person who's inherited a lot of the legacies of white feminism and its tendency to try to center white women amongst these discussions, sometimes it's also valuable to step back. I think we've all got a lot going on right now. Does anybody have anything that they wanna share, um, either about the book or about the feelings that are happening? Well, I don't wanna, Jump in if there's others, but I, it doesn't look that there is, so I will go. Um, I think one of the powerful things about 
this book, especially for a white person, certainly a white person of my age, white man of my age, um, is um, how powerfully and, and effectively it communicates the experience of living through this violence. And while I too am very relieved at this verdict, it won't bring George Floyd back. Um, and I, I think part of the work we have to do moving forward, I mean, and there's obviously much more that has to change. It's great to get a conviction in what seemed to me, and I think so many who felt, who felt the trial, like just an overwhelming uh, case, um, it has to lead to, to change in police practices. That's to lead to some kind of dramatic, you know, ch choose what words you want to use. Um, just dramatic change in how policing is done. And more, it has to lead to a society that doesn't systemically like hide this experience, right? And hide this pain. And so, um, you know, I think going forward to this, I, you know, I, I hope, you know, I don't know what's, how this um, verdict is gonna be received. You know, I, I just don't know, but, but we, we're, we have still have a, we're gonna have a long struggle ahead of us. And I think part of that struggle is um, certainly part of the work white people have to do is to open ourselves to this experience and to not shut it away, not turn away from it. Um, and this novel is just magnificent in its ability to, to make the experience real. Does anybody have anything they want to share, Kate? I just wanted to say that I really, really enjoyed reading this book uh, because of all the different, the new perspectives I gained and for opening myself and learning about um, what was going on for our star and her community and her, um, her family. Um, around uh, racism, but also addiction. And I mean, there were so many different topics in there that were just so painful. And anyways, I just wanted to thank you for introducing this book to me because I probably wouldn't have read it. I hadn't heard of it. And so it opened me up to something completely new. And I want to say thank you. Thanks, Kate. Um, yeah, I found it just so kind of both powerful and accessible at the same time. So, so. accessible because it was like a young adult book. It was so great to read, you know, first love and there was that going on and, you know, jealousy, you know, just like wraps you, brings you in and then you actually experience. Yeah. So I just loved it. I also had a great experience with a podcast recently also bringing me um, to learn more about Black Lives Matter and other, and it was called, um, um, nice white parents. Has anybody read that? Listen to that. That is a ride and a half for sure. Oh my yeah. gosh, that we could have our own uh, group around that. I mean, that was incredible. Kate and I are as, as, uh, the same parenting list, and this yes. is uh, a group of parents in New York who try to essentially gentrify a public school. That would be a good, like a group podcast discussion. That would could be interesting. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, and then uh, I also got so excited. I'm going to watch the movie tonight. So <laughs> of this, of, of this, uh, yeah. Did anybody see the movie and not read the book? Just curious. No, but I'll say the movie isn't quite as, there's something really special about the book, I think. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So what's going on in the news? Is anybody, um, does somebody want to like tell us what's going on? Cause like, I feel like a lot of people are probably on their phones right now. Like let's, this is a crazy time that the, our, our discussion and then this, the trial and the verdict, it's like, let's use it to like, I don't know. So I just saw somebody say, this is not justice, but accountability. And I think that that's 
kind of a good piece to a good way to put it because as, as just said and so many people are reflecting a man is still dead a girl doesn't have a father the system that enabled this to occur has not in any meaningful way if maybe a couple of aside from a couple of cities changed um i mean we we saw that that precisely the same police force just killed another black man last week right um and I think it's so, these things are so kind of complicated to, to balance, but um, accountability feels like a, like a good term. For so long, the crimes of so many people in power in this country went unanswered. As, as they did in the book, as it happens, right? I mean, how did you all feel when the verdict came out in the book? Were you expecting that? Did it feel like a plot twist or just the inevitable outcome in, in the book that, that, you know, a young black man would get shot and there would be no accountability? Well, if we, if she was, if she were writing it today, I wonder, I wonder if she would have put that there or not. I don't know, maybe it reflects 2018 more so. I, but I did think that, um, I did expect it. How about you, Vivi? Was that a surprise? Um, I wish I could say it was, but it really wasn't only because I saw how how the character felt and how how enraged she was she was towards the end. I kind of had a feeling that this would just be an event to kind of fuel in her that activism to kind of speak up after having not spoken up for so long. But I think the reason I felt that way is also because a big part of the book that I noticed and that really stuck with me was her friends also having their own implicit biases. Like she had that one friend who um, basically blocked her on social media when she started posting about um, Black Lives Matter and other incidents where she had no, of other incidents of police brutality. And I think seeing that and having that parallel between the cop that like literally shot her best friend and having this friend who she trusted and actually like almost looked up to and respected the having that friend also carry her own biases and her own form of racism in into star's life so seeing that and then seeing um how she had internalized that frustration and how it was so pent up until this happened i kind of had a feeling that the verdict had to come out that way in the book just to show that the character was actually taking an active stance compared to the passive stance she was taking before Jess, did you have a comment on that? Um, I have to wait till my office assistant stops um, voice. Oh, I have a question then. <laughs> um, um, VB, when we brought this up, the book, um, all three or all four of the stu students in our CNHB Board of Global Healthcare Engagement had read the book. They were like, oh yeah. And I was, I was kind of shocked. I was like, what is this book? So, um, and I, now I know why so many people read it, but is it, is it something that a lot of your peers have read? Is it like, was it like wildfire? Did everybody read it? How did you hear about it? Um, so a lot of us have read it. I actually first read this book when it came out, when we were in high school, um, it came out and I think one person read it and they were like, you have to read this. It's such a good book. And we all read it for two reasons. One, because this was also the same time as the election. So racism was a very hot topic then too. And so we were all talking about like, um, talking about racism in a political sense, but also just in a lifestyle sense and like a social sense. And so we read it for that, but we also read it because it's just such a well-written book and it's so engaging. So it's sort of one person read it. And then at least in my high school, everyone had read it within the first two months that it came out. So, you know, the, it's such a rich book. There's so much to talk about in terms of code switching, structural violence, racism on a personal level and a structural level, as you pointed out, VB. And I think, you know, Angie Thomas is really smart about even the names that she assigned the various characters and how those code certain ways of being in the world. Uh, one thing for me that was really generative as well was the, and perhaps one of the reasons the book evokes so much of an empathic response from people is 
the way that actually takes on grief, what does it mean? And, and I feel like we've been for multiple reasons as a nation really engaged in a process of figuring out how to grieve because of death on both a micro and a macro level. And, and some of what we see in the book is Star sorting out her own relationship to grief, right? For me, there was this very repeated sense of her saying, I don't wanna be valorized. I don't wanna be pitied. I'm not a hero, but I also want to be seen. And that was kind of this really poignant way for me to understand how to engage with grief, how to see people, but also honor what they were feeling. And I was wondering if anybody else kind of connected to this question of grieving and grief. I mean, you know, I read, I read this novel as a testimony as much as anything else, and I'm guided by it in a way. Was that something that resonated with anybody? Absolutely. I mean, I, I think um, uh, but partly I, th I think it's the story of, of, of a society. Um, you know, I think one of the most fascinating things um, for, some, for someone who, who, who doesn't live it is, is her uh, as stars having to go between different worlds, right? And she and and one of those worlds absolutely will not make space for her to grieve, and and will not recognize, cannot recognize her trauma. Um, you know, so that's that's yeah, absolutely one of the most you know sort of the most stunning things about it is is realizing um, how much trauma. Um, this creates in part it's because she's a direct witness but i feel like it's more than that as well i mean one of the things you you see in stars movement back and forth between the two worlds is how how that trauma resonates throughout her you know the black community garden heights you know in ways that williams williamson just doesn't you know it's not even they can't even fathom it. So, yeah. This is kind of related but unrelated, but I kind of understood the code switching that Star was going through, especially coming from two different communities. I I'm, I am an Indian American, so I would go. I went to a school that was predominantly white, and myself, I'm not Indian, and so there were certain incidences that now when I look back at it, I'm like, I realize that they were small incidences of bias and racism, but growing up, that's not how you see it. And so looking back at it, what I realize is that um, a, a lot of people and a lot of people that are in the position to actually make a difference and help kids understand that, hey, what you're saying actually has a lot of systemic bias behind it. If a teacher overheard that, they would just sweep it under the rug like it wasn't a big deal because they didn't want to confront the fact that it still existed in 2011, 2012. So I think that was one thing that I kind of understood that like, like you were saying with the um, one community not wanting to accept or understand her trauma, it's, I guess it's a lot of it has to do with the fact that we like sweeping things that are uncomfortable under the rug and not acknowledging that things still happen, things are still bad and systemic things still exist just because it's not a big incident, just because it's not like making headlines doesn't mean it's not a real thing that people experience. And I, I oh yes, Catherine. Oh yeah, I was just gonna add something to that because I, I had this moment this week, kind of my own self-awareness where um and my sister had asked me like, oh, have you been following, you know, things with the trial? And I just was kind of like, I just emotionally am so drained that I've kind of shut it out. And then at that moment, I was like, you know what? I have the luxury of doing that because of my, because I'm a, a white, you know, female living in America. And I kind of realized like I, that becomes part of like, that's my own issue that I need to deal with. But I was just so emotionally 
fatigued over this past year of everything that we've been through. And that brief moment of where I was like, I just don't want to, I don't want to have to think about it kind of made me aware that that's a luxury that most people, other people don't have. And that's my own, you know, whether it be a bias or just my own becoming aware of my own thinking um, that I have to, that I have to work on myself. But I just kind of thought about where sometimes you don't recognize some of the things you're doing or that you see as being, you know, an incident of bias or, um, this community not wanting to address these difficult topics because they have that luxury of not having to address those difficult topics because it doesn't exist in their world. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It was just kind of a moment of own like self, like, Oh, like I need to not be like that. I need to, I need to, to be, you know, bring myself, be a, paying attention and aware and part of the conversation and part of the solution. Um, but yeah, it was difficult though at times. Like I just, because I get very emotional. <laughs> so I had a, I would sometimes need to kind of close myself off, but yeah. I think that's fantastic insight. I mean, I mean, that, that is the essence of white privilege, right? Is the ability to ignore race. Um, and <laughs> It's that's such a hard thing to acknowledge. It's such a hard thing to, to deal with. It's such a hard thing to put down because it will be painful. Like you will have to keep pain with you. Then. And um, so, yeah, bravo. Yeah, it, I was I was looking. I had seen this cartoon that I can't pull up right now, unfortunately, but that I sometimes teach with, and it's the it's a split screen of the facts of life, where uh, a white father is talking to his son, and the air bubble is kind of the birds and the bees, you know, the sex talk, and then the black son is the black dad is talking to his son, and it's it's a gun and a police officer, right, and it. And I think in, in the novel, there's a, an explicit acknowledgement of this, right? Uh, Star says in the novel that she got two talks growing up, one about the birds and the bees and the other about what to do if she got stopped by a cop, right? So it really kind of resonates with what you were saying, Catherine, about what one is required to know and what one has the luxury of not knowing, right? What are the facts of life for Black and, you know, brown people in various contexts in this country that are very different set of facts of lives for white people. And that's perhaps the most explicit, but I think getting back to the earlier questions of when to lose your voice, when to use one's voice, there's a whole host of other spaces of things that I have the luxury of not knowing, right? And, and something that's so powerful about an intervention like this is illustrating what one does not know and what one can not know. So I think it's also worth reflecting, you know, in our own experiences, what are the facts of life for us, right? What are the things that we need to know in the world? And how does that change our way of intersectioning, intersecting with the world, right? What are some of the things that were important for our families and our lives that were just facts of life? Like, do you think Star's experience was pretty universal for black, for young black people in this country, that that's a key talk that all parents have? I mean, I can just personal experience. My, my sister is, um, has a biracial child. And so in, in this society, he is seen as a, a young black boy. And, um, and I know she struggles with some of those, those discussions. And, um, and I think it is a common, at least I can only talk from her perspective. I know it's a conversation she has and thinks about all the time, those types of conversations. Um, so I can't, you know, I am not in that position. So I, I don't know if that's normal for everybody, but I know for my 
for for that part of my family it is mm -hmm. And I think there's a, a lot of emotional labor that happens there as well. Sorry, Darren, were you going to chime in? Yeah, I can chime in just a little bit. Um, just a, a, my my, I am a cisgendered white man, uh, and so I can walk through the world and be as visible or as invisible as I as I need to be, depending on the circumstances. My son is adopted from Korea, uh, and with the rise in Korean or with with Asian American Asian American violence in America, uh, sometimes I see the world through his eyes, which are entire, were, were entirely foreign to my experience. Um, you know, his first reaction, he's a, a current student at Drexel and his, sometimes he says, man, Drexel's so white. And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, yeah, it's just like it, it's uh, his experience walking through the world is very different than my experience walking through the world. And so I learn a lot from from his and I've I've had those conversations with him, especially following the 2016 election, um, and sort of the rise of of uh, anti-Semitism and and violence that's been taking place over the past few years, um, actually for a long time, but more prevalent in the past few years. Um, so I've had those conversations about if you get stopped by the police, you know, make sure you keep your hands on the wheel, um, and keep you you know try to we. I, had those conversations, but not something I would have necessarily had to have if my son were biological, um, even though I, I think those conversations should happen amongst all people at all levels, because you never quite know what's going to trigger the police officer who's pulling you over, right? And I think that's, it, it there's an awful lot of bias that, um, tends to come out in the way we educate our police force. Um, they, you know, I heard a, a radio report this, this weekend about how, um, I can't remember what story it was, but it was something about how, like when they stop a car, they frequently will always, part of their training has been to like check to make sure that the trunk of the car is, they always push the trunk down to make sure that somebody with a gun doesn't come out and assault them. Um, which is an unusual piece of training. So therefore, if, if you're trained as though every problem uh, is a, if your only tool is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. Um, and I think that's one of the problems with the way that the policing system has been uh, rolled out to date. I think it's also just exhausting, right? I mean, you know, just hearing the stories that that folks are raising and then in consonance with the book, you know, Star says early on that, you know, there's, what does she say? There's never enough of me or no matter where I am, um, it's not enough to be her, either version of her. So she feels like she doesn't fit in when she's at home because of her experiences at school and she doesn't fit in at at school because of who she is, what she looks like, where she comes from. And that in and of itself, that level of code switching is exhausting, but then compounded by all these kind of privileges that other people have that, you know, she doesn't have access to or that um, people historically oppressed groups in this country don't have access to. On top of everything else, it's just exhausting. And that was one of the overwhelming things that I saw just even in the past two weeks, like yet again, like another black person killed in this country by the police, like that is just exhausting. And I'm, you know, what's the lesson or the learning from me, like how to ease that exhaustion or honor that exhaustion. And part of it is to educate myself in a way that doesn't require somebody who is very tired to be my teacher, you know. That's that I think is one of the reasons, you know, there's there's um, a lot of books you can and should read as a white person rather than sort of, you know, I mean, I, one of the things about this book is it, it does take away your ability to say, oh, I don't understand. I mean, it's it's right there, you know, um, and there's a lot of ways we could learn. Um, listening to uh, you, your uh, reflection, Darren, which I thank you for. I mean, 
I wonder if we could talk, uh, turn a little bit and think about what this means for Drexel as a community. Um, yeah. It's interesting we said, like how many you know, the observation, like what a white place is. I don't doubt that. Maybe. What could you uh, say? How can we... Tell us. How can we be better? You know, what should we be aware of? Like, like for instance, one of the things I'll say is, you know, I'm... Um, you know, as an educator, I have a definite commitment to this idea that painful things should be talked about in events like this and uh, are to the good. But, you know, I, I want to hear f like maybe like maybe that's part of my bias and, and, and I should learn something about that or how to do it or something. I, you know, I don't know. But um, but what what can this a book, this experience that we're going through? this past year, this past week, this past day, what can, what can it tell us about what we need to be aware of and maybe work on at Drexel? I don't know. I don't know if that's going to be easy to answer, but it's a question I have. And no pressure on anyone in particular to answer. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Um, I can say that I have also had conversations with other Drexel students where we have said, like Drexel is such a white school. Um, we have talked about how there are um, certain instances or incidents that we've seen at Drexel where it's very obvious that just the background that a lot of kids come from, you know that they were never taught or had, like we've been talking about having those conversations, those like different types of talks growing up. Um, you can tell that they've never had the second talk. So that's one thing that we've noticed. And another thing that um, that we've also mentioned that like, you know, it is like going to Drexel, it's an amazing school. We're so grateful for the education we get here. And we're so lucky to have the educate the educators and just the education we're getting. It's so well-rounded and so important. And a lot of us chose Drexel because of what it can give to us. But, um, and we'll continue with Drexel because we know what it can give, give to us. And we're so grateful for it. But we have noticed that there are certain times where I've noticed that like, this is a small example, but changing my name, like my name, the name I go by at school is not the name that I, I, my family calls me. It's not the name that it's not the cultural way to say my name, but I go by this name because I know it's easier for the community that is at Drexel and it'll, it'll help me more at Drexel using the other name. So I think like star having that, that code switching and having that, like those two lives, basically, it's something that a lot of students at Drexel also experience. And it's one of the reasons why a lot of the clubs at Drexel are so culturally bound, because you want to connect with both parts of yourself with other people who also understand that you have multiple sides to who you are. And it's very difficult to only play one role all the time. That's really powerful. Thank you. And I think it also speaks to the way that you framed it, which I hadn't heard before. And I really appreciate about the clubs as opposed to the classroom experience. You know, so much of Drexel's rhetoric is about this applied experiential learning and integrating our lives with our learning. And that disconnect is an important corrective. If people are not feeling the space and safety and encouragement to be themselves within the classroom, then there's some real thinking that needs to be done about the pedagogical spaces. Is that's precisely the kind of arena in which there should be the ability to, you know, be be the various parts of oneself and with no pressure on anybody, right? People might choose for multiple reasons to leave one aspect of their identity at the door when they're walking into the classroom, but to create space for it to be possible to not do that, I think is, you know, both consonant with what Drexel imagines itself to be and, and a great way to educate and create a learning community. So I thank you for that and I will be reflecting on it myself. So I don't want to um, fall into the trap of looking for the white hero, but can we talk about Chris? <laughs> uh, 
Um, I'm curious if we should see him as a model ally, or is he more complicated than that? Like, like I, I'm, I don't feel real settled about that. Um, so I'm just curious what how, what other people's reactions to his. I mean, he's not the white hero, and that's one of the refreshing. You know, that's a, that's sort of a trope in so many movies, so many books by white people about about these issues. Is it all goes back to them, but but he's nonetheless still a significant character, and he plays a significant role in Star's life. And I just wonder what what people think of of him. I also really want to hear this. <laughs> I mean, just gut reaction's good, you know, like, I hated him. <laughs> oh, no, I, I liked or, him. I loved him, yeah. I liked him. I thought he was a, I thought that they, they had, like, this, I mean, after they started to talk about what was really going on, they had a really healthy relationship once that was broken like the the um the wall mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i'm thinking i guess i'm thinking your comment just through today's events because i keep thinking well of course you're right that he's not the white hero because there can be no hero khalil is dead right right, right. and i think the novel does that well um and I think Andrew Thomas is a really capable and thoughtful writer. And that's why, you know, he, he's not the white hero. And also we have kind of the counterpart in Haley, right? So yes. There's no yes. risk of, <clears throat> no, kind of no. utopianizing. No, she's not letting you out that easy. <laughs> <laughs> but but I still wonder, I, I think his character is interesting. And I think I think his his reactions. Um, you know, the conversations they have on that, you know, the night of the protest when all hell's breaking loose, it's just really interesting. And I just wonder, um, yeah, I leave it out there. And, um, I guess one of the other interesting things about it is, you know, this is, it's a young adult novel. It's a high school novel. It's a novel of coming of age and love. And like, this was not an issue I dealt with in high school, in my high school relationships. I mean, there were other things, but uh, you know, something about how this country forces, especially people of color to grow up very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting how Chris was sort of um, almost indifferent to the fact that Khalil was dead, but noticed more how Star was impacted up until he realized that that the Khalil that had died was her best friend and how that sort of got him interested into what was going on. I think that's a, it's very interesting. It's a, one of the ways a lot of young adults are getting involved with um, understanding racism and understanding social issues is that it happens to someone you know. Up until it doesn't happen to you, you don't have to know about it. But the second it happens to someone you know, instantly you now have a, you have a stake to hold in it. So I think that was very interesting. And that sort of switched my perspective on Chris as like a real solid ally, not the white hero, but a real ally to both Star and to the Black Lives Matter cause. I also think that speaks to Catherine's really compelling point, right? And in some ways, there is the luxury for white people to to not care until it's somebody that they know, right? That's just not true for other people. There's never not someone they know. It's never not potentially themselves, right? So um, I think we see that in all kinds of contexts, both in the context of um, racial violence. We've seen it in the context of the pandemic, all these people who refused to wear masks and it kind of being politically weaponized until they themselves got sick, right? Which again was, was really vested in a privileged white community, that particular attitude. Um, that 
on the one hand, I I hope it's true, Vivi, that there's a, a phase shift, you know, because people are seeing firsthand the devastating results of these pieces. And I almost wish it didn't have to be that way. I mean, I think it is both a, a credit and an indictment to Chris, which is why he's an interesting character that he was able to hear and care, but that also at first he didn't, right? Which also feels very realistic. And when it comes to violence, we get numb really quickly, especially people who are not personally affected, right? The number of stories that is too much for people to care about when it comes to devastating events is two, right? You care about one person. And then when it becomes more than that, it, it becomes a kind of meaningless statistic. So I think we're, we're kind of drawing to the end of our time, but before we finish and ask for folks to offer any concluding thoughts, I read that Angie Thomas said that the author said, I look at books as being a form of activism because a lot of times they'll show us a part of the world we may not have known about. And that resonates to me with Bibi's opening provocation about using one's voice. And also at the same time with the awareness that there's, you know, systemic oppression and structural racism in places like the publishing industry, right? And whose voices dominate these kinds of discussions. So I guess I wanted to ask, in what ways does that resonate with you? In what ways does one's own voice feel like a form of activism in the world where so many of these d discourses are occurring on social media? Can text and speech also be a way to allied responsibility? Like I sometimes feel like I sent an angry tweet, so I'm good now. Like I did activism, you know. Um, how do we, once again, I guess, accommodate the space for acknowledging people's right to have a voice, but also make space for the voices that aren't always heard? Any thoughts? Did, did you see this book as a form of activism? Well, I'm really glad you brought that up. Um, yes, I, I did, but I but I think it's because um, I or or to put it another way, I guess what I really appreciated about the book was its explanation of of how this activism and this particular movement uh, came very organically out of this. Um, uh, this this historical moment and the trauma of of these you know these these horrible uh, killings, um, so you know, I'll sort of like putting my historian hat on, I can imagine this being an, you know a document that that in the future can be plumbed to try to understand this movement and how it arose. So I, so I I think it's really like. Like you, I have a little resistance to the idea that oh, writing, you know, writing is activism. I think it's really important to be on the street sometimes. And I, and I, one thing that I really appreciate is because one of the things that we're real good at, <laughs> we being white people, is like, oh, I know how you feel, but you know, like if you break a if a window gets broken or something, or you know, like, and I, I don't mean to minimize, right? There, more than broken windows in some of the demonstrations, but it had to happen. Like, I mean, it has to happen. There has to be that kind of movement. And I think um, as a, a kind of um, an account of where, the, uh, of the Black Lives Matter movement, I think it's really powerful and I hope, I think it certainly, it certainly fuels my political imagination. And, and enlarges my sense of what's possible and what's important uh, in the way of public demonstrations. And I, I wonder if younger people read it that way, because one of the things I, you know, struggle with is, 
in the classroom is creating that kind of sense of political possibility. Like, like we're real good at getting students to recognize problems. Oh, the world's really, you know, what are we gonna do about it? Nothing can be done, right? I mean, this book says something can be done and, and, that, and that being in the street, that coming together as a collective and being in the street for all its problems, for all its dangers is really, really, really important. And I appreciate that. I think it's also important to understand the difference between activism and performative activism. We're like sending an angry tweet, reposting something on Instagram. Yes, you mean it, but if you're not doing anything to back up that claim, what are you really doing? Because you can talk about how supportive you are of everyone, but then when it comes to your real life and you have a family member or a neighbor saying something extremely racist, are you really gonna stand up, stand up to that person? So I think reading these books is so important because they are activism, because they make you think about, they make you do your own introspection and realize that, hey, I might have in my own biases in my life. Like these issues still exist. These authors that have almost lived that, have lived this experience. They're talking about it. They're telling me about it. I need to listen to them. But just reposting a black score on Instagram isn't going to be enough. You have to actually back it up in your own life and in your own thought and in your own like mindset, I think. And I, I had actually um, chatted with Sharona and I said, what other books do you recommend? And then I realized, wait, I should just open it up to the group because I bet you just said, you know, you just said reading these books is just, you know, very powerful in trying to get to where we want to go in our journey in this. Could you recommend something possibly that you, that, uh, VB? So there was a book that I read a while ago. I cannot remember the name of it right now, but it was very similar. It was, um, can't remember the title of it, but the whole story was basically about, it was talking about dismantling racism and how we have, um, how racism still exists throughout history. And it was like, it's like a two part parallel book where one part is a very, it's a, it's basically written as like a nonfiction biography. It's very historical, very collegiate level. It wasn't as enjoyable. And then there's that version for teens, which is a very like cut down, very easy to read. Um, basically like dissection of how racism got to where it is today. It, I can't remember the name name of it, but- Is this I, Ibram Kendi's book? Um, I think so, Stamped yeah. Stamped from the beginning is, is the- is Yeah, the, Stamped from the beginning, is the, yeah. To, uh, difficult one. Yeah. I can't remember the name of the version he wrote for young adults. I um, think it was called Four Teens, I believe. But I can't remember the name of it. There was a really good read. It was very, very helpful in sort of understanding how we got to where we are today. Yeah, it's a great book. Yeah. Um, and for a more of a, a novel, Such a Fun Age by Kylie Reed. I don't know if anybody's written. It's actually a Philadelphia-based novel, and it's about a young woman who uh, works as a babysitter, a young black woman who works for a babysitter. She's a Temple student for uh, a white family. And just the experience of being a young black woman in Philadelphia, and it, it, it is a, just a great novel in general, but also really in all of its moments captures the nature of those interactions. I, I was just going to add something that um, kind of which Jesse was talking about how, you know, at, with activism and how I think there's all different types of activism. And there was um, this group of nurses that I was actually doing a lecture at Columbia University on implicit bias. And one of the ways to address implicit bias is to kind of go out of your, is to force yourself to go out of your comfort zone and to learn other, about other perspectives. And so this group of nurses up at Columbia actually formed a book club and it was primarily white nurses, but they read um, authors from all different ethnicities and to, and books like this to, on try to begin to develop understanding of different perspectives. And so in its own way, I think that's a form of, of activism for them really trying to grow personally um, on a personal level to understand different perspectives. And there is a book actually that my son had to read in high school this year, and it's, it's um, Native Son. And so it's an old book, but um, it was written, I 
think in like the forties or fifties, but it really gives this, for me, when I was reading it, I kind I felt the anxiety of being a young black man in a 1950s, you know, America. And I don't know if that has changed that anxiety level. And so I, it was just, I felt like it was very powerful from that perspective. Yeah. I think this is a great moment to reassert that um, we seriously would, would are considering making this an ongoing series. Uh, and it's joint between um, uh, the Board of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and also uh, Global Health Engagement. And so we're very open to suggestions people might have. Um, and maybe, maybe as a follow-up, we can we can get the word out somewhere or another that that we would welcome ideas people have for um, books to read um, on these areas. And as a side note, for those of you who live in the city of Philadelphia, if you email the librarians at your local library, they'll curate a list of books for you and prepare them for you and get them ready. And you can just walk to the library and pick them up. It's fantastic. I love the library so much. And I'm kind of driving myself a little bit bananas because I'm trying to remember. I did have the librarians put together a list of books of uh, the Black experience in Philadelphia. I can't remember all the wonderful titles that I read, but um, there's a lot of excuse me, wonderful work uh, out there. And the librarians are really fantastic. And the Drexel librarians are also really fantastic. Um, and our library is not just a place to get academic books. You can actually get novels through the library. You can interlibrary loan them if they are not in the collection. At the moment, they will ship them to you. So you can <laughs> really just get it uh, with the click of a, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. Um, so I pay for faculty, but. So through some amusing glitch, uh, no fault, I think of our librarians. Um, <laughs> we got the German ver ebook version of this. Yes. <laughs> I'm so sorry. And next time we do the, um, the, uh, the project, we'll make sure to get a different license. Yes. So Rachel Daughter writes Hood Feminism, another amazing text. Notes from the women that forged that that a movement forgot by Mickey Kendall. Yes, a fantastic text. Um, any closing thoughts by any folks? Thank you all for your honesty and for reading this thick book and coming to to share with us in a very fraught time. Any closing thoughts? Darren? Hearing no uh, closing thoughts. Thank you so much for joining us and we hope we'll see you next time at Tuesday Topics. <laughs>